This is the second Sunday of Lent, and there is a reminder to the men of the parish that this coming Saturday there will be a Lenten recollection. Uh, we had the women's yesterday, so one for the men this coming Saturday. Please see the bulletin for details. And you are all so reminded of the Easter duty that Catholics have the grave obligation to receive Holy Communion worthily once during Easter tide, uh, during Lent or Easter time, sorry. This is the will of God, your sanctification. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Uh, reverend fathers, dear seminarians, brothers, Sisters, my dear faithful, we have this um, beautiful call to sanctification in the epistle today. We will see the, the final cause and the exemplar cause in the transfiguration of our Lord. He sets before us his own divinity to which we are meant to aspire. But first, let us consider the, the stark warning in the epistle that we might appreciate the gospel all the better. So St. Paul tells us that we are to possess uh, this vessel of our human nature, of our human body in sanctification and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles that know not God that no man overreach nor circumvent his brother in business. We must not be prey, be slaves, be servants of the passion of lust, of self-indulgence, of sensuality, of self-absorption, of egotism, of all that is self-centered as those that know not God. And the, the next vice, if you like, that follows from that uh, will be, so as, as the person becomes more and more consumed with themselves and satisfying their own nature, even their basest of passions, the more they are likely and almost doomed, if you like, to damage their neighbor, to sin against their neighbor. And he mentions the, the, uh, the clearest that would be against justice, so don't overreach him in business. But the, the consequence follows. The more one falls a slave, if you like, to their own fallen nature, the more they will um, injure their neighbor. The whole order of creation has been overthrown because their, their lowest powers, rather than serving the higher, are, the higher powers are now serving the lower. And so everything in creation will be overturned for that soul. And you see then the motive. Uh, if you act like the Gentiles, uh, it's because you know not God. Don't be like unto the Gentiles that know not God. Well, if I'm acting like the Gentiles that know not God, then I must not really know God. And we have then the, the answer, or so it would seem the answer in the gospel. Well, here is your God. Here he is in glory. This is who you worship, this is whom you adore, and this is the reflection of the happiness that he intends to be yours, that he intends to be mine. And shortly after this, which the apostles see in fear and trembling, our Lord says, now remember, don't tell anyone about that. Don't tell anyone about that. So this is certainly something very mysterious. I only present two possible reasons. God uh, could have many, but we simply see that, well, what 
what is true and therefore how this might reflect that truth is that if everyone saw so clearly the divinity in the time of our Lord, then certainly would not we and every generation that followed our Lord think, well, where is my manifest display of the, the divinity? That simply it's the, the beatific vision here on earth. Shouldn't we all be receiving that? If our Lord said, well, tell the apostles and I will give that vision to the apostles, I will give that vision to, uh, to anyone that asks. Of course, we would see that to, to have that vision face to face, there would no longer really be need of faith. And yet, God wants to be served in faith. He wants us to give over our judgment to his judgment. To say, this is true not simply because I think it's reasonable, but because you have said it's true. Christ is the light of light, the true God of true God. And that light of, the, uh, of pure wisdom, you might say, is far greater than ours. And so this first thing that our Lord would ask of us, as you know, is faith. And so this knowledge of God is not merely about vision, although that will be its perfection. Here and now in our state of life, it's through faith. And so our Lord gives them this for a moment but then says, but beyond this, you must live by faith. You and the others who I won't actually even give that much until after my resurrection. And that is the, the next thing to note, that this greater knowledge of his divinity, and when that will be expressed more and more clearly and more and more definitively, is to come after his resurrection, therefore after his passion. Because our, our Lord wants more than adoration. I think it can broadly be said, someone might know some um, obscure uh, religion that somehow contradicts this, but in general, there is only one faith of all the religions upon earth that have ever existed. There is only one that says you should love God, that you should love our Lord, Jesus Christ, who is God. Just one. And that's the Catholic faith. That's the true faith. So. I could say, I suppose, save to the end, but I'll just dismiss that quickly. Of course, you have the Protestant religions, which have taken the body of truth and then corrupted it. So you have, insofar as they've received the body of truth from the Catholic Church, they will still speak of, and in fact do, love in a certain way, to a certain degree, our Lord Jesus Christ. But that's only because they've taken that from the Catholic Church. If you, and the Catholic truth, from the, so from the true God. But when you look at other religions, the pagans had no notion of that. And their service of their gods, their adoration of their gods, was simply to appease them from brutality against them. Render this sacrifice so he doesn't hate us. Do this so they don't punish us. And when you get, for example, notions of love, if we can even call them love, it's actually just because the gods were themselves so human and not godly that it was just considered, well, the god is actually no different than a man. And so they are performing their impurities and things like this just as wicked men do. So it was really just the denial of their godhood which suggested that there might be some kind of even immoral love uh, between the, the two. But whenever you simply have the more mystic gods, there's no, of India or whatever it might be, there's no sense of loving them. It's simply appease them so they don't harm you. And the same is true with Islam. 
The Muslim does not love his God. In fact, that's why he hates the Christian religion, because for the uh, Islam, God is necessarily far above us and has nothing to do with us except to create and control. But he's absolutely going to be disinterested in anything but simple service. So love presupposes some kind of parity, some kind of equality, uh, and that is actually an abomination to the Muslim mind. And so Christ brings about that parity, says, well, I will assume the human nature so that I can raise you up to the divine nature to give you grace. And so we really have a sense of, well, I can love my God. So when our Lord reveals himself in the transfiguration and we see the apostles trembling before him, even though it's so beautiful and so good, they tremble. And they fall down in fear, and Peter just starts rambling. And that's not where our Lord then just leaves it. He doesn't want us to worship in the way other religions worship. Don't worship me just so that you don't go to hell. Don't worship me even though it be the, the best thing to keep you from injury by following the natural law, by following the, the order of creation. Love me because I love you. Love me because I am good, but love me. And so we have before the transfiguration another presentation of our Lord before his creatures this time before many more, where he is just as divine, but that divinity does not show out nearly in the same way, and that is when he is in the praetorium before Pilate. And Pilate presents him to the mob and says, Ecce homo, behold the man. The same Christ at the transfiguration is the Christ uh, in the praetorium, behold the man. And see how Pilate sees that. Pilate, who has been willing to ignore the truth, because this is the truth's representative, and he is pitiable, he is pathetic. Yes, he deserves sympathy, but he can't help me. I can't, uh, and uh, he's in need of help himself, so um, he certainly can't help me. And there you have, if you like, a, a reflection as well of how many look upon our Lord. And upon religion, it's something weak and it's something insipid, sentimental. It might be nice, but it's all rather pathetic. It can't really help anyone. And is it because Christ does not have the power to help or it's their own perception and what they've made it. And they made it that way often, and Catholics are not above this. And my dear seminarians, I, uh, I hope you remain above this, but if we treat our faith insipidly, if we don't live our faith courageously, that is what it will become. Well, I'm not praying now because now I need real help. You know, well, yeah, I, I pray because it's devotional, but if I really have a problem, I'm not going to go before the Blessed Sacrament. This is Pilate. This is Pilate. It's something nice but pitiable. Then you have the Ecce Homo for the Pharisees. Again, same God as at Tabor, but for them, it's simply the enemy of what I want. He's the enemy of my pride. He's the enemy of my self-indulgence and he must be crucified so that we may not have to, that we don't suffer. And Christ does not have suffering planned for them, but again, it's their perception. If I follow Christ's law, I will suffer. Therefore, better that he be despised, ignored, hated, than I have to suffer. God grant that we are all far from this uh, terrible position. And we might do well to think of how the Father from heaven looked upon that, the Ecce Homo. He certainly would have said it in a very different way. 
he might have spoken of the first man, the whole man, and to what he has been reduced by sin. And still, again back to the epistle, the Gentiles knew not God. Look how man has been reduced by sin and knew not God. So I sent Eche the Deus Omo. Behold, I sent the God-man. And look what sin, what your sin has done to him, and you still don't realize it. Do I act like the Gentiles that know not God? And yet, why has the Father sent him out of love? If on uh, Tabor we see his divinity shine forth in this, this terrible sufferings of the passion, we see his mercy and his love shine forth. And we must reflect upon that. Otherwise, we will be as the Gentiles that know not God. What good does it do to know him if we don't know him? We know his name and nothing about him. So our Lord, again before, uh, he says, uh, let my divinity somehow be hidden until after the, the passion, so that people will have seen my love first and appreciate more than uh, that love when they realize it's the divinity that has been suffering for them. But don't have them tremble before they love. Have them love that they need not tremble. And as we go through then this Lent, we might consider that that Ecce Omo must finally one day apply to me when I stand before the judgment seat of God. Behold the man. Behold the man upon whom I have showered so many graces, who I have favored before others. The seminarians, the brothers, the sisters, of course, everyone by their degree must say that more than of their neighbor. I tremble how much I must say that, 22 years a priest, how favored by God's graces. But everyone here, one in a million, everyone here, one in a million, to have the true Catholic faith in this time of chaos, how I have been favored. Behold the man, and what has he done with it? Covered with so many sins, so many attachments, so many vices, despite being fortified by my sacraments, despite being enlightened by my gospel, what has he done with it? We will stand before the judgment seat of God and those words said, what will our answer be? And God grant through the intercession of his mother that it be that despite all these sins, I had faith and I live that faith day by day as best I could. I know I am a sinner, but I, I knew my God and I tried to live that. Again, how can you say that you knew your God because I abandoned myself to the divine uh, heart, to the sacred hearts? I trusted more in them than in myself. I did not try to vindicate myself when accused. I did not, again, follow all those maxims and principles of the world. And then our Lord will say, well, yes, despite all these wounds that you have suffered, this is someone that knows God. If we cannot say that, then he will say, well, I knew you not. You are like unto the Gentiles that knew not God. Let us turn to his blessed mother, that such an accusation um, never be proven uh, true of us in this life or in the next. She who is the mother of mercy, the mother of compassion, um, is the one we need in this time of, of mercy because we know if we look into our hearts how much we need it knowing how much we need it let us respond in this Lent and throughout our life to every grace that God gives us and truly live by faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost Amen